surgeons can settle as uh, refractive surgeons by starting ICL practice. It doesn't require much of the equipment and those fancy gadgets. So all to you, uh, Dr. Kamal Kapoor. Dr. Kamal is, as we all know, is a great name in FACO refractive surgery, and he has a chain of hospitals span India, talking on choosing the right patient and right-sized lenses. Uh, <coughs> uh, good morning, everybody. I think uh, thanks to my friend Sonu. And I can assure you, you know, this is going to be a, a very interesting uh, IC for all of us. There will be a lot of cross-learnings. So I'll be restricting my talk only to patient selection, choosing the right patient, and sizing up. Because unlike your normal IOLs, the only sizing up you need to do probably is your astigmatism and your biometry, and you're good to go. But the game is very different in a fakey lens. There are a lot of parameters, a lot of exclusion criteria which you should be looking at to take care of uh, your patients. So getting it right. First of all, I have no financial uh, association with any of the product I'll be talking about. So more than 3,000 fakey cows done and long follow-up of nearly 15 years plus. So let's look at a few of the options available. The options available in India are, you know, you have the star ICL, you have the RIL, you have the biotech lens, and you have the IPCL. My main experience is with the IPCL and ICL, so I'll be restricting my talk more so to that. Uh, IPCL more majorly done a lot of cases, so, but the learnings will probably be the same, with a little bit of few shifts here and there. So I'll be restricting my talk only to the selection exclusion and workup and investigations. So patient selection and exclusion. This slide is very important. You always have to dilate your patient apart from slit lamp if you have a direct ophthalmoscope. See the patient. You will be surprised you can catch early lenticular sclerosis in some patients. Now, these are not the right patients for you because their myopia is not going to be stable, and very soon they probably will be blaming you for the cataract if you do a fake lens in them. So any evidence of nuclear sclerosis, go in for a lens extraction than a fake chiral. Look for corneal dystrophies, look for endothelial counts, Anterior chamber depth, the cutoff is 2.8 millimeters. Now, let me tell you, the anterior chamber depth is not the cornea and the anterior chamber. It is the internal anterior chamber depth, from the endothelium to the anterior surface of the crystalline lens. Lens rise, this is a very important concept. I have introduced this since last three years. Now, most of the surgeons all over the world are uh, kind of using it. I was the first one to discover how this CLR will affect their outcomes. We'll see how to measure CLRs. Always measure your pupil size. Most of the speakers will not talk about pupil size. Pupil size is very important, both for surgery and outcomes. If you have a very large pupil, these patients will have an edge glare of the lens. So you have to plan a larger lens for them. And if the pupil is not dilating properly, preoperatively, even with tropical seal plus, the surgeon will have problems putting the lens behind a mid-dilated pupil. Give, I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a 13.5 millimeter lens and the pupil doesn't dilate beyond 7, 7.5. You're stuck up. For a beginner surgeon, you should avoid such a case because manipulating the lens in a smaller pupil, a larger white to white is going to be tricky. Large resting pupil size, again, you need to plan a larger lens. For glaucoma, please rule out glaucoma, do a gonioscopy. Look for peripheral anterior signing case. Look for pigment dispersions. If your angle is less than 30, you need to do a PI. I would refrain you from doing the surgery for a beginner because the, I'll, I'll share some studies. I've done studies of, over more, hundreds of patients, and I've come to a conclusion how much of an angle will go down once you put in a fakey lens. Keratoconus patients, it's a very, very good tool to help your keratoconus patients once you stabilize the keratoconus, but then you have to manga, measure the angle. We'll again see those situations. So we'll talk mainly about the ICL and the IPCL. There are different powers available. Sizes available, IPCL, of course, gives you many more sizes since it's in, available in, uh, you know, changes of 0.25. You can actually fine tailor the whole uh, thing. Let's see the preoperative workup now. If you have to do the refraction, even if it's a myopic eye, do a dilated cycloplegic refraction. You will be amazed. Some of the patients are accommodating and wearing a wrong power. I remember a, a, a young girl I, I, I operated, she was wearing minus 9, and on the cycloplegic refraction, she was 6.5. She was just over-accommodating, and she always had a complaint of headache. 
So the moment we tried to do a fogging and relax her accommodation, she was doing fantastic with 6.5. So we corrected for 6.5. Otherwise, she would have landed up with a always accommodative state. So the conventional training is that hypermetropes need to get cycloplegia. Please, when you're doing a fake cleanse, do a cycloplegia and take the assessment. White to white measurement, take different measurements. And if the two eyes are separate but more than 0.2 millimeter white to white, recheck. This can only happen if there is a lot of difference in astigmatism of the patient. But if there's no astigmatism difference and the white to white is different, there is something going wrong. Most common reason for this is most of the imaging systems are based on a white, black and white imaging system. So a lot of times it can take in some scar of the cornea as sclera and sometimes pigmentation of the cornea as iris. Some blood vessels on the edge of the cornea as iris because in black and white it doesn't have a color. So always do a manual override. I'll tell you how to do it. In case you have an automatic imaging system, you can actually go on a manual override. I use a Cirrus machine for that. I go to a manual override, and then I manually check the graphs and charts. As I said, keratoconus, you have to be very, very uh, uh, careful. Anterior chamber depth for beginners, I would say, take three millimeter as a cutoff. It'll, you'll be far safer. Once you've done four or five cases, then you can go to 2.8 millimeters. We always do biometry for these patients just in case because these patients are prone to retina detachments, not because of your surgery. The, most of them are high myos, minus 20, minus 30. So at that point, you're probably going to do a surgery and lens extraction. So it's a good idea to have a biometry. So we do a biometry beforehand. Gonioscopy, specular microscopy. Now getting it right, most important, as I said, I just kind of reinforce the point, cycloplegia. If there is some intermittent squint or a foria, please mention it because most of these patients will have it and after surgery, they start noticing their eyes and they say, you gave me squint. If there is an ambulopia, mention it. Tell the patient you are ambulopic, you will not have a 6-6 six -six vision. Document it because these patients are prone to come back to you because it's an expensive surgery. They will want the best out of it. Contact lens trial to actually see what is the best achievable vision. Look for lenticular changes. Now, in case you're planning a toric lens, the accuracy of your cylindrical correction acceptance has to be very good because this lens you're going to put there for life. You will have a chart with which you can actually place these lenses. Breaking points where things can go wrong. If you're white to white, I think that's why I've under, uh, underlined white to white. White to white is the most important part where things can go wrong. In case you're in doubt, throw the data to the manufacturer or supplier, they'll help you with that. Uh, then watch out for a uh, steroid responder. There are some of these patients may have used steroids in the past. You can ask them that because post-surgery you will have to use steroids. So tell these patients, take a history for that. Now the role of pupil size I've already mentioned. You can how to measure the pupil size. We have an automatic pupil size me measurement in my Cirrus machine. It automatically keeps changing the illumination. You can measure, you can see from 3.43 to 6.75. So that's my uh, photopic pupil size, 3.43 and scotopic 6.75. The pupil size approximately has to be multiplied by 1.25 to get approximate optical diameter. The role of interior chamber depth is also very important. The interior chamber depth is from the endothelium to the anterior lenticular surface. You can measure it on any system, Pentacam, Cirrus, Obscan, they'll all give a very accurate reading. In case you don't have any, you can do an immersion biometry by an expert optometrist and do an apachymetry in the center and you can subtract it. Based on that, add 0.2, just for the error. Because you cannot be very sure. And you will mostly get a very good accurate reading. This, if you've tried this, it works. So is 2.8 finally okay? No. And yes, both. You could have a 2.8, but you could have angle abnormalities. So you need to watch out for that. You could have a 2.8 anterior chamber depth, but the resting pupil size is very large. It could be a non-dilating pupil. Irish configuration could be flat or concave. In case you have that, you will have more chances for pigment dispersion and glaucoma. So it's not just 2.8. You need to look at these things. Lens rise, we will see how it's done. Keratoconus, you need to look at the anterior chamber and posterior sani care. Now all these things, in spite of a 2.8, could be a big no for you. As I said, the, the, the way the iris falls, flat, concave, convex iris will decide. Now, the lens rises when you draw a line from an angle to angle. The amount of crystalline lens which rises above this is the lens rise. Now, guess what it can do? You could have a good anterior chamber depth, you could have a good angle, but if your lens rises higher, the chances of the 
fake lens touching the crystalline lens are higher. The chances of you landing up with pigment dispersion are higher. So the cutoff is 600. Beyond 500, if your interior chamber depth is 3.2, it's a good idea. But below that, you must reconsider your uh, initial plan to do the surgery. Now, this is very important. Angle measurement. <clears throat> this is the pre and post. The role of angle measurement. You can do it on an OCT machine manually, but it takes some practice. But if you have an automated machine, which does that for you. So you will see this. So we use this machine, Cirrus. So you can see actually the angle here before surgery was 50. Post surgery is 35. It's gone down by 15. Average, I've seen it goes anything between 15 to 19. It goes down. So if you have an angle of 32 to start with, planning an IPCL could be tricky or an ICL could be tricky. It will go down by another 15 or 18. So even if the company says no need to do a PI and you have to do this surgery, do two PIs. I do it one at 11 o'clock and one at 1 o'clock. That makes it more safer. Now, if you see just under the, uh, uh, the angle, HACD, you see the lens rise. Before surgery, it's 0 0.05, and then it becomes 0 0.80. The 0 0.80 is a false lens rise. The machine is measuring the IPCL now, or the ICL. It's not the real lens rise. So it's a good idea to have these machines. Once again, the volume, the, the angle going down by nearly 15 degrees every case. The white to white is the most important. There are various methods of doing that. I'll discuss that with you. Always take the mid limbal line. I'll be going very fast now. Uh, take the mid limbal line. You can also use an auto refractor keratometer. Manual auto refractor keratometers give you fairly accurate thing provided you've learned to identify the mid limbal line. Now, the same thing which measures your pupil will measure your white to white. So this is one method I use to counter check. Apart from vernier calipers, I use this to counter check. It works fantastic. It works very accurate. In case you're using an automatic ma ma imaging system, do a manual override. Take the reading, go to manual, and then measure on the machine with a scale and see how it's actually working. UBM can work, may not work, because there are no nomograms. As I said, any variation more than 0.2 millimeter, please recheck. Have somebody else recheck because it's very unlikely there will be such a difference. Selkers to Selkers measurements have never been done. How do you plan the lens? You go up by 1 to 1.5 millimeter more, depending on the interior chamber depth you had. Suppose you had a smaller interior chamber depth, you go for 1 in my practice. And suppose I have a higher interior chamber depth, I go for 1.25. In case I have an astigmatism, I go for 1.25 because larger the lens, tighter it fits. It doesn't rotate. So with a non-toric lens, you can get away by a little lesser vault. But with a toric lens, a lesser vault may cause rotation. So the vault is the depth, the, the difference between the, your uh, endothelium uh, from, sorry, the posterior part of your phacic lens and the crystalline lens. And ideally, it should be anything between 400 to 700. We have patients who have more than 1,000. But then the anterior chamber depth was good. Angle was good. You can get away with it. The vault changes with the pupil size. Very bright light, if you're trying to measure the wall, you'll get a lower wall. And low light you're getting, so you need to take an average. Or you need to have a mesopic condition in your room when you're actually checking the patient finally on the last visit what's happening. Planning a toric lens, go for the next bigger size. It gives more stability. This is the complete workup sheet. It gives you the specular, the biometry, the interior chamber depth, the angles, the specular count, everything. This is a sheet for workup. So unlike your normal cataract, this is different. Now, this is what happens if you have a very large pupil, even during surgery. So, Sonu, this is just a small little video. Now, you can imagine I can't see the iris. The, you can't see the iris because the pupil is so big. So, enclavating the uh, crystalline, uh, the, sorry, the fake lens uh, behind this is tricky. So, sometimes you need to irritate the iris slightly by going in, touching it, make it shrink, and then find it. So, these are small little tricks. This is a patient where the vaulting was wrong. You see the vault, the, uh, the fake lens is rising above the iris. So wrong calculation can do that, and you need to explain such lenses. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal, for that wonderful uh, talk. I think uh, that actually is the, you know, the basic of the ICL surgery. The sizing is the most important, and uh, it's the, the key to a successful ICL surgery. Uh, I'll just uh, ask from the audience, how many of you are actually into ICL practices? 
so that's wonderful and how many of you are using uh, what devices are you using for white to white because essentially as kaval pointed out it's basically the two things the white to white and the anterior chamber depth so these are the two basic calculation which have to be bang accurate for a successful icl surgery so uh, uh, talking to you kamal so what do you recommend it should be a gold standard for white to white let's hear from it now because we have i think three very voluminous surgeons here so kamal uh, white to white which is the gold standard for you i think apart from standardizing the white to white there are some optometers in your team you need to ratify that they are the ones who do it because you can't be doing it everything it everything yourself so you need to train some optoms by yourself like uh, you may have a lot of optoms so you can't let everybody lose on that so what i have done is in every of my center there are two optoms who are ratified personally by me because i have trained them how to catch it so they should do that that's number one should it's only one optom if you have in your team train him well number two i always use three methods to confirm and the one which is the median one of all three is the one i go with yes i may have errors like you just saw but that's in fraction maybe 14 cases in more than 3 3 1/2000 surgeries wrong sizing but that's too too less so what i rely on is on my cirrus and i do a manual override we take an infrared image and we go on manual and on the manual there is a semi circular uh, a mark you can actually move it i switch off the light so that they don't confuse me and i train the optometrist to look at the mid limbus you just put these two lines together usually there is a difference of 0.3 to 0.2 mm in most as taken by the automated machine but in case you have standardized your reading on the automated you can go for that over time after making a few mistakes you will come to that number 2 auto refractor keratometer is fairly accurate down to 0.1 mm because whatever reading you get on your cirrus we counter check it double blind which means this person who's doing the cirrus mapping just puts the data in the sheet and the sheet is kept there and then another boy outside is doing an auto refractor keratometer he notes it down and finally the vernier caliper I would not say that the vernier caliper is the gold standard for me vernier caliper is only to reconfirm because if you start with the vernier caliper at least in my organization if i give three optometers the same vernier caliper none of them will have the same reading it's so subjective so it is only done to find a median so out of these three suppose i have a lot of variation whichever one is giving me the median value of both of them i go for and usually it's 97 98 99 percent right so shital if if it's a <clears throat> single surgeon chair practice so what do you recommend should be the gold standard for the white to white i think uh, the uh, we use the digital caliper as well so three readings of digital caliper and three readings of pentacam for that's, white to white <clears throat> and that's okay. on a slit lamp or a supine microscope position yeah a patient in the supine position uh, a quick word from uh, dr sanjay chaudhary sir see i am i am totally <coughs> what kamal is saying digital caliper the manual method you send three doctors or three optoms to measure they will all come up with a different reading absolutely but at least they don't go dramatically grossly wrong so it's giving you a security that you are somewhere there then you have to choose what is perfectly point one level difference yes right so you have to choose some other a uh, digital device some like a pentacam or or any other lens star or something and you have to get used to it normally all these optical devices give about 0.2 or 0.3 more than your digital caliper right because like uh, kamal said uh, you are measuring uh, white to white from the intermediate to the intermediate zone right all these opticals cannot measure the intermediate they measure from the outside because they change uh, meaning from the change in the color density so that is why they are a little more than your digital caliper now suppose you start measuring white to white from the outer sides probably they'll be equal so now what we started doing is why have the discrepancy we started measuring the outer to outer a personal difference we started with inner to inner if kamal you would remember some years yeah. back i was always saying uh, black to black then we came to inter